Episode 9 works for several reasons in its own right, but sadly the actual development of Korok's character is never mentioned again or put into practice after this episode, which is just so disappointing. I mean, the episode isn't all sunshine and flowers. The flashback Korok has of Aang and the rest of the gang is kinda shoehorned in. They totally fuck up Aang's character by having him be pissy at Toph. Toph, I'm 40 years old. You think you can stop with the nicknames? Afraid not. Oh, that bitch. Oh, that bitch. I mean, why would you do that to a character that the audience hasn't seen for ages? Why would you have his first appearance involving him being pissed off over someone calling him a nickname? So besides that kind of shoehorned in old gang stuff, the actual Yukon trial scene isn't too bad, and it's a nice payoff from the build-up over previous episodes. Aang gets kind of retconned for a bit by not being able to instantly blow Yukon the fuck away, but whatever, they have to have tension somehow. Also, it's pretty good that Tenzin and the crew don't have a magic solution to finding Korra, and are actually totally wrong to begin with. However, the highlight of the episode is Korra finally realizing that punching everything can't solve her problems, and actually meditates to find a clever solution to her situation. This is fantastic, and something I've been waiting for desperately until this point. And although her character never does this again, the fact that she even overcomes something through change is positive progress. Taluk being angry at Korra makes sense, as you can see it's just directed at her despite him being really annoyed at himself. My life is a disaster now. You crawl through the window. Plus, the unexpected Amon scene is great. Amon just brushes off Talok's bloodbending. I mean, that's like, oh shit, son. <laughs> he just shook that off like it was nothing. I mean, not even Anne could do that. So Kuro gets development for now and solves something without punching it. Unexpected Amon is great, as is Talok's depowering, which I totally didn't see coming. Amon being a badass is great, and his character is becoming truly terrifying, both as a physical opponent to Kuro and an intellectual one. Although I don't think she'd be too much of an intellectual challenge against him. So overall, actually a pretty good episode. While I object to the constant referencing of the original series with the whole gang coming back and all that, the episode feels better conceived than the rest and everything just kind of works. Although I would say that at the end it does feel like there's not really any focus and you don't know where the next episode is going, which in some cases would be okay, but for a season like this you really need to have that overarching drive for the characters. Best episode in the season so far, apart from episode 4 maybe, and at this stage you're like, okay, they had a few missteps, but there was only a tiny bit of romance stuff in this episode. I mean, we're only three episodes from the end, this has to be going somewhere good, right? <laughs> right? Right, Brock? So episode 10 goes back into the trend that's been seen before crap after something is good or interesting. Korra has literally taught me to never get my hopes up about anything because as soon as I feel like something is starting to get good with the show, it takes a massive fat shit on itself. It's like if you went to a restaurant and ordered an entree, but when you're eating it you realise it's uncooked and tastes awful. However, right before you're about to send it back, you find a cook section and it actually tastes great. So the waiter comes past again and gives you another dish and he tells you that it won't be uncooked like last time, but oh man does it look delicious. However, as you're about to start eating, the waiter pulls out a katana and commits seppuku all over your duck ravioli. This is literally what Koro does. It bends over backwards to make itself shit and kills itself in the process. Anyway, episode 10 is crap and I'm not even going to bother really going into it because it's just rehashing the same old complaints I have with the other episodes. The action is pretty bland and nothing creative is really done with the bending. The mecha tanks they're fighting aren't really interesting and there's a reason that the last airbender had the characters fighting them sparingly. This fart humour and the whole role reversal in this scene is just so strange and out of place. I mean, do you really think an audience who would be interested in the social politics involving the plight of non-benders and the marginalisation of them would also be amused by potty humour? So a baby is born and no one cares, Lynn gets her bending taken away which is kind of meh. We don't really know her and as an audience we know that it'll all be resolved nicely and everyone will get their bending back eventually. Anyway. On to the big one, the thing you've all been waiting for, the big blunder that is, the season finale of Korra, season one. So before I fully go into the extent of how retarded this episode is in terms of, well, pretty much every element of storytelling, I have a small confession to make. Avatar as a series has a track record of kind of pulling shit out of its ass for season finales. And before you go shit your pants and spread it into a comment, allow me to explain myself. Do I think the Crossroads of Destiny or the Siege of the North are bad? No. Do I think the series finale is bad? Well, not really, however each demonstrates some of the weakest elements of the seasons. Weirdly enough, all the season finales have both fantastic elements and really weak elements to them. The main theme I see in all of them is Aang not having to resolve his problems from a character standpoint, and just being given the solution instead. In the season 1 finale, Aang turns into a giant fish spirit monster thing and destroys a massive Fire Nation fleet, and doesn't really have to change as a character or overcome any past difficulty to do this. This isn't too bad because the episode in general is great and it makes sense that he could do it after meditating and other things that I won't go into. In the season 2 finale it's much better because Aang has to change as a character and let go of his earthly tether to achieve his goal of the avatar state, however this is cut off early by Azula which is totally fine and makes sense, 
but the whole spirit water thing is a little bit of a cop-out. However, it doesn't bother me nearly as much as it bothers some people as it was totally set up from the previous season. It's the series finale though that has the biggest cop-out, with Aang being given the solution to his problems he faces as a character and physically by a deus ex machina. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this term, but in case you aren't, it's when in storytelling a seemingly unsolvable problem or situation is resolved through a contrived manner or unexpected intervention that was previously unknown to the viewer. This is pretty much what happens with the lion turtle and Aang hitting his back on the rock. These solutions come out of nowhere and don't require Aang to change either physically or mentally to overcome his blocked chakras or inability to kill. Ong's problems are solved for him in a manner totally out of control, and it just feels so cheap. Really, he didn't have to do anything to achieve these things, and makes his legitimate character development up to this point feel rather obsolete. Does this mean I hate the series finale? No, definitely not. The Agni Kai battle between Zuko and Azula is absolutely fantastic and one of my favourite moments from any TV series. However, I can say without a doubt that these Deus Ex Machina are really the only decisions in The Last Airbender that I completely object to. Other decisions can be put off as being poorly executed or having to be there for the audience they're aiming at, but the whole Lion Turtle thing coming out of nowhere just doesn't work from a narrative or character point of view and feels like such a sour tinge to the end of such a great series. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because a lot of the problems that The Last Airbender had are greatly multiplied in Korra, with the worst of all being the Deus Ex Machina stuff seen at the end of the series. The final episodes of Korra Season 1 or 2 are so bafflingly self-destructive in a way I've never seen before, so I'm pretty much going to be a pedantic asshole and talk about everything I hate with this episode. Most of the episodes I took a ton of notes on, but just didn't mention most of the stuff because it was pretty minor. However, I'm going to go full out here. First off, in the beginning, the gang are established to be at their weakest point, which is pretty standard as far as narrative structure goes. However, Kuro's attitude of punching everything is still pretty annoying and a bad trait for your main character, seeming as it outweighs her redeeming qualities. Plus, her character overcoming punching shit in episode 9 is totally lost now and she's reverted back to her old self, which is just infuriating. Koro and Marco go back to camp, but Sami acts like a shit smudge for no reason, and Koro tries to do the whole Aang being stuck in an iceberg for a hundred years and everything's changed so quickly spiel. But it doesn't really work because the legend of Korra isn't the fucking last airbender, and it never will be. I mean, if you're gonna do a sequel to a series that's totally different from the original with opposite characters, location, and style of narrative, then why do you feel the need to constantly have references and shoehorn fan service from the original series? So I'm on a show and taking people's bending away, and in his hot as fuck husky voice, he's like, of your impurity. But then it shows there's like 30 people or more there. You'd think he'd get bored of saying it or his voice would give out or something. So for like 7 minutes or so I have no notes on the show because I think I nodded off or something? I took another look at the section of the episode and it's just a bland fight scene so I can see why. Even for a series finale, by this stage it just feels like everything is going through the motions. Characters are doing stuff and you just don't care about it. The show seems to take itself so seriously yet it's so poorly written. While The Last Airbender always had this level of self-awareness and fun but still had the ability to have great emotional moments like these. I mean, are there any moments in Korra that even come close to the leaves from the vine scene or Zuko and Iroh reuniting? So more stuff happens, relationship stuff also happens, and people do things. The voice actor for Zuko is in the show for fan service, and I continue to be cynical. So now we get to possibly the most hated and confused aspect of the season. The thing that is always mentioned as being the soul destroyer of it besides maybe the love triangle crap. The reveal that Talok is Amon's brother. I mean, I remember watching this and just being like, uh, what? Not even like an, oh my god, what a twist war, just a really confused like, Wait, are you actually serious? That's the reveal? Plus the fact that they built it up before a commercial break. I'm Amon's brother. <sighs> what a twist! And then as soon as they get back, Talok literally just tells the audience that Amon is from the Northern Water Tribe. He's a waterbender and a bloodbender. Really? I am still confused to this day why they decided to make Amon like this. I mean, why? Why would you make someone who has really interesting ideals be the one thing he fights against? And if you're gonna do that, at least do something interesting with it. It's such a cop-out, I mean, what a way to utterly ruin a character that you built up so well. Even if you don't agree with me and think that Amon being a bloodbender is totally fine, why show your menacing villain that you built up for the entire season as a child and then as an edgy teen? Why reveal who he is? and totally undermine the surprise of who he is. Why have a fucking 8 or 9 minute exposition about the villain in the middle of the fucking season finale? Like holy shit, talk about pacing issues. I cannot believe that Bright would have had this in mind from the start of the season. I mean, when they were planning it, were they like, Ah yes, so we're going to build up this Amon character a lot and make him really intimidating, and in the second last episode, flippantly reveal him to be a bender for no apparent reason. 
and then show him as a child right before Korra fights him. It'll be brilliant! I can't even describe how terrible an idea this is, so I guess I'll just continue with my complaining over a cartoon for kids. Yet again, I'm not really even angry, just so disappointed that an idea as interesting as non-bender equality is just wasted in the span of eight minutes. Yet life somehow manages to continue, albeit barely. So the whole reveal of Amon's face is totally wasted now, and the fact that he has a scar doesn't change the fact that for whatever reason, Bright decided to prematurely show his face. So following suit from the series finale of The Last Airbender, all the hero's problems are solved without them having to work for the more change in any way to actually achieve them. So for now, not Zuko goes and takes down some airships, and it's like, eh, I don't really care about this person I've just met, though the actual action itself isn't terrible. Asami faces off against Papa Sato in what I guess is the conclusion to something, but it really just brings up the question of why this even needed to be a plot arc in the first place. I mean, did this really need to be in the season finale of the show? Why would I care about this character that's barely been around and was introduced a quarter of the way in with one really out of place episode to develop this conflict before it was forgotten about? So Korra goes and saves Tenzinu, who somehow got captured even though it's never really explained, and yet again Amon manages to dodge and avoid every single attack. What did Mako say before about that? Oh, that's right. Any attack we throw at him, he'll redirect with his mind. That's how he's been able to challenge any bender. He uses his bloodbending to dodge people's attacks. Wait, what? I mean, this is just set off handedly, but how would he possibly know this? From the looks of it, getting bloodbent fucking hurts. Wouldn't anyone notice that when they were attacking this guy, they always seemed to miss because their arms jerked around? Plus all the scenes with the Mon just show him dodging the attacks normally like a chi blocker, so I don't really know why he even says this. So as Korra and Mako are bailing from the Equalist rally, they decide to split up with the airbending master to get away from Amon, and end up in some random storage room. So Amon blood bends Korra and takes her bending away, and you're like, now I wonder what sort of shit they'll have to pull to give it back to her. Also that whole thing that Amon said about, I have a plan, and I'm saving you. For last. Yeah, that turned out to be a bunch of crap, unless he considers an empty storage room to be part of his big plan, but whatever, just another disappointment that doesn't pay off. So Mako manages to shoot lightning at Amon somehow, and although this would most likely kill him, it only temporarily wounds him and he seems fine like a minute later. I mean, in retrospect, Amon being able to walk off Tarlok's bending makes sense because I assume he was counterbending his own blood or something, and it makes sense in that context. But making a human character practically invincible is just stupid and serves to further remove the viewer from the reality of the fight. Then again, as I'm saying this, I'm talking about reality in a fight of magical kung fu elemental people shooting lightning at each other, so I guess the show kind of counters me on that one. Also, why doesn't Mako take this opportunity to fucking kill him on? For all he knows, he's already dead, but if he's such a big threat, then why not just kill him? Or at least beat him into near death? I mean, what was your plan going in anyway? Stop all of Amon's henchmen and then somehow beat his bloodbending abilities so you could incapacitate him but not kill him? So Mako follows in the steps of every slasher movie victim in that they don't kill their attacker when he's down and makes a run for it instead. It is almost a shame to take the bending of someone so talented. Almost. This is actually pretty good. Amon seems genuinely sad and it's actually like, oh shit, that's pretty full on. However, it's utterly ruined by Korra airbending. This is where my mentioning of the previous Avatar series really comes in. Korra airbending against Simon is something that her character doesn't have to work for to achieve, and it's just pulled right out of the writer's ass in a deus ex machina. I mean, we knew it was coming because it's something she'd struggled for for the entire season, but the actual moment of her getting it is in vain as it just comes out of fucking nowhere. She doesn't have to do anything for it to happen. Maybe you say, oh, but it happened because she loved Mako so much, and it made her both tear bend and air bend. However, if it was because she was all hot pants for Captain Eyebrows, then her love for him didn't have to change either, and it was just the fact that she cared about him that she got airbending, which in itself is fucking stupid. Her breaking out of bloodbending is equally stupid, and makes no sense given pretty much every other instance we've seen of it. I mean, sheer willpower does not equate to the ability to move against someone controlling every muscle in your body. So stupid shit ensues and completely ruins what could have been the climax of a really interesting villain and the great potential for Korra to change as a character. However, it's not only squandered but totally shat upon by completely ruining Amon's character and making a joke of basic narrative structure in terms of characters achieving their aims. The fact that Amon was a bender does not mean that the actual idealism of the Equalist was wrong, and really the actual argument that they have is never really countered by anyone. Why would the fact that the leader is a bender completely neutralize the entirely plausible and generally pretty reasonable idea behind the group? 
What's the point of having an enemy that is mainly an ideological one, only to defeat him physically and then never mention or counter what he stood for? I mean, even if it was cheesy, we should have at least seen Korra logically argue against Amon's ideals before beating him, and we probably would have been able to see her develop as a character too. However, the show is left as is, and what that is is a totally underwhelming and overly disappointing final. However, the episode is over yet, and Bryke still have a little more shit left up their asses. So in the end, Korra is able to get her bending back literally by crying. I mean, she cries, and then Aang turns up and solves her problems for her, and he says that at the lowest point, humans are open to the greatest change. So yep. Great moral here, kids. Cry hard enough and your problems will be solved for you out of fucking nowhere. Good one. Also, anyone else knows that Aang totally looks like Abraham Lincoln? I mean, he's got the beard and everything. So Korra goes all Avatar State, everyone gets their bending back, and they all live happily ever after. Except how can Korra now go into the Avatar State at will? I thought you had to unlock all of your chakras to do that. I mean, Ung was a monk and meditated a ton, but even his chakras were blocked. Are you trying to imply that Korra is let go of her fear and guilt and earthly attachments? Or are you pulling up my limp dick again? Don't you know I only get hard for Asami suffering? So that's the final of Korra's first season. What did I think of it? Well, I fucking hated it if you didn't already guess. I mean, what a cop-out, what a waste of such potential. I so wanted the season to be good and the final was really the last hope for it, and it really had the chance to redeem the entire thing. We could have actually had a great ending and most of the season's problems could have been forgiven. However, it ended up being the worst part by far and the biggest blunder of a show I've seen in a while. Now while I'm all up hating this disaster of an episode, I'm not forgetting the whole Tarlok scene at the end, which I think could have been fantastic given the right circumstance. However, keep in mind that a murder-suicide scene such as this one is set two episodes apart from a series of airbending fart jokes. So what do I think of Korra Season 1 in general? Do I think it's the worst thing ever? No. Do I think it's good? Definitely not. Now I think I've given the series a little bit of a hard time, and I don't hate every aspect of the show. The animation and artwork are fantastic, as is the voice acting for the most part. On a technical level, the series excels. However, this is just more disappointing when the content in the show just can't live up to it. So I've gone through the technical aspects that I believe are wrong with the show and how aspects of the story don't work on either a character or a narrative level. However, there are some things you just can't strictly analyze. Overall, the writing itself just felt worse. Like there wasn't that wit or spark that The Last Airbender had. I'm sure you can look back at every nuance of conversation in The Last Airbender and come to some sort of conclusion as to why it isn't as good as Korra, but I'm just gonna stick with the fact that the writing just took a quality dive. Didn't matter what the content was, the writing itself just felt weaker and blander. On top of this, I just don't really think the idea of Avatar fits in very well with the way that Korra actually plays out. The whole joy of The Last Airbender was the fantastic world building they had, and how there'd be a new setting or type of character in each episode which created this general sense of movement and flow. Yet in Korra we're stuck in this kind of crappy steampunk city that isn't really even explored at all. So even before the series started, the decision to have the whole show set in one central location instead of having the adventuring aspect that The Last Airbender had was a mistake. So as far as I see it, Bryke are already on the back foot. Also I see that it's no coincidence that Book 3 had world exploring in it and was also by far the best season of Korra. So now I'm going to get into the production aspects behind the actual show. So for those of you who don't know about the production of Korra, it was kinda shit. Nickelodeon kinda fucked around with Bryke and they weren't aware if there would even be a season 2, so they had to have a completely self-contained story within 13 episodes. On top of that, Bright wrote the entire thing themselves, which might not sound weird considering they created the show, but if you look at the writing credits of The Last Airbender, you'll notice that there's an entire writing team working on the show, with Aaron Ehaz being the most notable in terms of quality episode writing. On top of being head writer, Aaron Ehaz, and I'm assuming that I'm naturally pronouncing this wrong, wrote The Storm, both parts of The Siege of the North, Bitter Work, and The Crossroads of Destiny, to name a few all of which are some of the best episodes in the entire series. Now I don't know a whole lot about the actual production side of the show, so this is just speculation, but really I think Bryke would have benefited from having other writers to bounce ideas off. And for anyone who knows about writing, it's always great to have someone to ground your ideas and discuss them with. Obviously this isn't always the case, considering that Season 2 was even more of a shit pile than Season 1, and that had a bunch of extra writers from the original show, so I don't know, maybe it's just that Aronet has magical touch. Now this is where I'll draw my Star Wars analogy into Korra. Probably forgot about it, didn't you? Well, so did I. As far as the prequel films go, George Lucas was renowned for having no one to tell him how terrible his ideas were. No one could challenge him creatively due to his absolute control that he's known for, and he ended up writing a horribly misguided script that I'm sure he thought was great. 
Though sometimes having too much creative input can be a burden, you really need to have some opposing opinions to argue against. Because even if you don't agree with them, at least you know that you have a solid argument in favour of your opinion. However, I don't think Bryke had anyone to really challenge their crappy ideas like pro-bending or the love subplot, and didn't have enough self-control between just the two of them to realise how bad the ideas were, or the writing level that the original team on The Last Airbender had. And while I don't think Korra shits itself to the extent that the Phantom Menace did in any way, there are some pretty fucking weird parallels. So I already mentioned earlier how similar the original series was to The Last Airbender, however the prequels are also strangely similar to Korra both in terms of content and the production side of things. The new series is either a sequel or a prequel to completely original source material, with the original creator or creators coming back after some time to take the helm. The series is set a distant while from the original but contains some characters from the original series. Both are set in a futuristic city and focus to some degree around politics, at least more so than the original did. Both involve main characters you just like that are poorly written with the most sensible characters, Obi-Wan and Tenzin respectively, being put on the sidelines while other characters do stupid shit you don't like. Both have horrific pacing issues and generally poor writing, including fucked up poop humour that wasn't present in the original. Both also involve an evil politician who everyone else thinks is good despite him being obviously evil. The villain is built up and has little development besides stage presence and then has a massively underwhelming ending fight scene. Both have an annoying character that you wish would just go away or grow up, in this case Korra and Jar Jar respectively, although I don't think that's really a fair comparison considering that Jar Jar is literally the Elzebub. There's also a completely irrelevant love subplot that takes up way too much time in the series, leads nowhere, and finishes with a rushed ending. Both have boring fight scenes due to a lack of creativity and development of characters, and neither achieved the level of world building that was present in the original. The series also tries to appeal to every audience possible, which ends in a tonal mess. The series appeals to fans via references and cameos from the original series, a drawn out love plot for people who are into that, baby tear fart and poop humour, as well as politics in an attempt to appease everyone. I mean there are probably other similarities that I haven't mentioned, but thinking about the prequels for any amount of time actually hurts, so I'll just stop before my brain explodes. Originally I was going to discuss how good Season 3 was looking, as it was just being released at the time that I was first writing this, however due to production times for creating this and the quick release of Season 4, it looks like I might not even make this in time for the end of the series. On a side note, I really did enjoy Season 3, as it was a massive step up in quality from the previous season of Korra, and nearly on par with The Last Airbender's first season, so at least there's a somewhat happy ending to this review. If you guys want to see me review Season 2, then give me a heads up. I've already got notes for it and all that, but I'm just kind of waiting for the response I get from this before I go off and write another fucking 12,000 word essay on a children's cartoon. No seriously, this review was 12,000 words long. I'm writing a fucking thesis on The Legend of Korra. Thanks, Bryk!